Tabernacle, which is a pattern of heavenly things. <clears throat> it reflects a divine order, a way of approaching God. People just can't barge into God's presence. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a protocol, a holy protocol that's involved. You see it in the tabernacle approach here. When you come to God, there's got to be a sacrifice. It has to be one. If for you, not from you, for you. Mm -hmm. A blood sacrifice, the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. And when you come to the Lord, you must be clean. That's a waver. You gotta be clean. You can't come before the Lord defiled. Before sometimes it, there will be requests you will make to the Lord. Before you make your request, you make sure you're clean. Confess to God. If there's something between you and the Lord, confess it. Acknowledge it to the Lord. Be clean. And in the in the <clears throat> tabernacle, you saw the environment in which God is served. He served where there's light. Illumination. Mm -hmm. He served where there's food, table of showbread. He served where there's a fragrance, something pleasing to God, the altar of incense. But in the tabernacle, the real purpose of the tabernacle was to get in the most holy place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was the, that was the most important thing. There's where the atonement was made, there's where the speaking from God was received. Where the insight was received, the holy, most holy place. And now in Christ Jesus, the most holy place has been opened. And this is all pictured in the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was made according to a pattern that was shown to Moses verbally. And apparently it was shown in image also. I want to remind you of this. Exodus 25 verse 9 says that Moses was to make the tabernacle according to all that I show thee. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So not only, not only the tabernacle itself, but everything used in it. There was a pattern given to him. Exodus 25, 40 says, Look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. See, he comes over this again. Mm -hmm. Don't just make a candlestick the way you think a candlestick should be made. Make it the way I showed it to you. In Numbers 8 and verse 4, he says of the candlestick in particular, This work of the candlestick was of beaten gold. Under the shaft thereof, under the flowers thereof, was beaten work according to the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses. And it was very elaborate, you know, that candlestick. Make it the way I told you to make it. Why? Because it's reflecting heavenly realities. People aren't going to understand my salvation unless you do what I tell you to do. Light is a very large and complicated thing, very ornate to be illuminated from God. There's like seven candlesticks, three on each of the shaft of the middle. There's a lot of oil that illuminates. So this is a depiction of what was in the most holy place. <clears throat> also the temple that that Solomon built, it was, it was after the order of the tabernacle, except much larger. It was made according <laughs> to a pattern too. Now I'm going to read these verses. There's several of them. Now the reason I'm reading them is a lot of people don't realize the temple was made by, according to a pattern. They actually think David just kind of, kind of cooked it up himself. But David presented the idea to God, something God never told him to do. Those who say you can only bring to God and give to God what he commanded you to give, they forget about David building a temple. God never commanded him to build a temple. He came up with that himself. Then God gave him the pattern how to build it. Mm -hmm. And I want to read those, uh, those verses to you. This is David talking to Solomon, giving him the charge. Now, if Solomon actually built it. David got everything ready because he was a man that shed blood, <laughs> a man of war. So God wouldn't let him build it. <clears throat> Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. <laughs> and the real thing was this Ark of the Covenant was really the whole issue here. It had to be a place where that was stored. Be strong and do it. 
Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat. And the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasures of the house of God and of the treasures of the dedicated things. <coughs> Also for the courses or orders of the priests of the Levites and for all that work in the service of the house of the Lord and for all the vessels of service in the house of the Lord, he gave gold by weight for things of gold, for all instruments of all manner of service, silver also for all instruments of silver by weight, for all instruments of every kind of service, even the weight of the tank candlesticks of gold and for their lamps of gold by weight for every candlestick, and for the lamps thereof, and for the candlesticks of silver by weight, both of the candlestick and also the lamps thereof, according to the use of every candlestick. And by weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread, for every table, likewise silver for the tables of silver. Also pure gold for the flesh hooks, and bowls, and cups, and for golden basins he gave gold by weight for every basin, likewise silver by weight of every basin of silver. And for the altar of incense refined by gold by weight and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. So it's pretty elaborate. Mm -hmm. Pretty elaborate even down to how much of the goods that they possessed. You notice there he said that he made the cherubims. If you read back in the First Kings, you'll find that he made two cherubims that were 15 feet high. <coughs> Ten cubits. Remember, these are solid gold. 15 feet high and their wings, one was put against this wall and the wings went over and touched the other wall. And the other was put on that wall and the wings touched this and the Ark of the Covenant was underneath underneath of them. Quite an elaborate. <clears throat> now we're going to touch tonight on the mercy seat which was on the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> the mercy seat was made of pure beaten gold. It was uh, hammered out. It wasn't in poured in a mold. It was actually hammered out and it was very elaborate. The mercy seat was three and three-fourths feet long and two and one-fourth feet wide or deep. Exodus 25, 15 tells us, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half should be a length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Remember a cubit is 18 inches or a foot and a half. There were two cherubims, which are angelic creatures, on the ends of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, no one knows exactly how these looked. These are some, pe some people's depiction of the Ark of the Covenant and the wings. Cherubims were on either end of the Ark of the Covenant. Their wings touched each other. They had to face each other with their face looking down on the mercy seat. This is another which I think probably was a little more according to it. The wings seemed to spread out over the Ark of the Covenant. These again are human depictions of, of what this uh, what this was. It was very very ornate, pure gold. And if you wonder how God, if God can keep things safe, I mean, let I me mean, have a little diversion here for a moment. Some people are of the opinion. In fact, I once was asked to sign this as a pledge in a place where I worked that I believe that the Bible was inspired in the original language. I refuse to sign it. Well, I do believe it was inspired in the original language, but I believe this one's inspired too. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, a mercy seat as large as this was three and three-fourths feet long and two and one-fourth feet deep made of solid gold how do you think that thing could survive 40 years without someone coveting it and trying to take it? Mm -hmm. huh? 40 years. Mm -hmm. They had caught all kinds of enemies, and why didn't Achan ever covet that? When they got into the uh, 
land of Canaan into Jericho, Canaan found a wedge of gold and he covered it there. Why didn't anyone cover this? God kept it. Just like he kept his word. Amen. God can do that. He can protect what's dedicated to him, much more his word. These cherubims had wings outspread that covered the mercy seat. Now the whole, this is like a lid. We might call it a lid to the Ark of the Covenant. The scriptures tell us about this, uh, these overspreading wings. Make one cherub on the one end, the other cherub on the other end, even on the mercy seat, shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. This is Exodus 25, 19. Verse 20 says, And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, that's left high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look to one another, that's face each other, toward the mercy seat shall their faces of the cherubim be. So they're face to face, looking down on the mercy seat with their wings covering it. <laughs> Remember now, this is a pattern of, of heavenly things. There is considerable that we know about cherubims in the scripture. It's not enough to write a book about. <laughs> if you look in the Bible bookstore, I can guarantee you there's no book there on cherubims. Because they're so mysterious, even the doctors of the law can't come up with some application <laughs> But there's significant in scripture. First mention of cherubims is in the Garden of Eden. They're the ones that kept people from coming to the tree of life were cherubims. Mm -hmm. And also there was a flaming sword turning every way. And I me thinks perhaps it's still there. I don't know, but no one it'd be you'd be looking in vain for the tree of life, let me tell you. Oh, people would love to find that. <laughs> Some people look for a fountain of youth, but they couldn't find the tree of life because the cherubims kept people from kept people from coming to it. And cherubims are depicted as God's depicted as dwelling between the cherubims that were on the Ark of the Covenant, which is quite a quite a vivid picture. First Samuel four four refers to God in this way. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. How's that for a picture? You wonder how personal God is to you? God's very personal, but he dwells between the cherubims. And again, this is mentioned in the book of Psalm, that he dwelt between the cherubims. In fact, I believe I counted about 20 times in the scripture, that phrase is mentioned. God who dwells between the cherubims. So you had, that's where he talked. There. And God is depicted as riding on a cherub. Now the King James uses cherubims, which is plural. Some of the other versions say cherubim, which is a plural word. Cherub would be a singular of cherubim. And 2 Samuel 22, 11 says, He rode upon a cherub. It's kind of an intriguing, intriguing expression. It isn't that God has a form is on one. The idea is, is that he's surrounded by angelic personalities when he comes, which is more for our protection. <laughs> They're created. A cherub has been created, and when he like, protects us from immediate contact with God. And Solomon, he made the cherubs in the temple. The record of these 15-foot characters are in the book of 1 Kings, the 6th chapter, verses 3 through 29, which is a, quite an elaborate text that talks about these cherubs. Ezekiel saw a vision of cherubims in Ezekiel, the 10th chapter, and he heard the sound of their wings, the scripture says. So I've heard people say, angels don't have wings. So just tell those people to go home. They haven't read the scripture. The scripture says he heard the voice, the noise of their wings. It must have been very significant. These are not little bitty creatures. And they're called in Hebrews 9, 5, the cherubims of glory. And they're called that because God dwelt between them and his glory was seen in the, in the cherubims. And the uh, mercy seat was placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 10, 1. I looked and behold, uh, or uh, excuse me, Ezekiel, Exodus 
25, 21, thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, on top of it, not as a base, on top of it. Put the mercy seat. Exodus 26, 34, thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. So this was in the most sacred part of the tabernacle. <clears throat> I want to get the picture here. Here's the ark of the covenant. It had the law in it, tables of the covenant. It had a depiction of divine supernatural nourishment, golden pot of manna. And had a depiction of divine guidance, Aaron's rod that budded. But we had to have something covering all of that. It was too, not covering to hide it, but covering to tell you how it came to us by mercy. So there was a mercy seat covering all of this. So, but you couldn't get at the law without mercy. You, you couldn't have divine direction without mercy. You couldn't have divine nourishment without mercy. Mm -hmm. Mercy. See, mercy. God didn't have mercy, we wouldn't be saved. That's just that simple. Right. If God didn't have mercy, Israel never been chosen, never been delivered, never been guided. Mercy, mercy, not works. Mercy, mercy is the thing. Now the ark of the Co the ark of the covenant with the mercy seat. Here are some things that are known about it. God appeared in a cloud above the mercy seat. Now here's what the text says. It's Leviticus 16, 2, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. You don't be coming in here all the time. In other words, the old covenant was a covenant of distance. Couldn't come close. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, my glory is going to be here, so don't you come in. I tell you, you have a good reason to rejoice that you're living under Christ because now he says, come in. That's right. <laughs> and he got more glory. There's more glory in Christ than there was on the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. Another thing about the mercy seat, the cloud of incense, the altar of incense was immediately before the veil. The Ark of the Covenant was immediately after the veil, and the incense was to penetrate through that veil and cover the mercy seat. Here's what the scripture says, Leviticus 16, 13. He shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat. It's an appeal to mercy. God not only has mercy in the law and in the tabernacle, you have people appealing to his mercy. God doesn't give mercy just reluctantly. Oh, well, I'll just give mercy. He is pleased to do it. Mm -hmm. Again, it says of the mercy seat that blood had to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. This is where the atonement, the atonement was made on the mercy seat. The atonement for sin was not made at the burnt altar, the altar of burnt offering. There was blood poured out under the altar at the foot of the altar. But the atonement wasn't made there. The atonement was made on the mercy seat. Leviticus 16, 14, and 15. Ye shall take the blood. This is on the day of atonement, which is the only time they could go in here. That was the only day. Once a year on the day of atonement they went in to the most holy place. He shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. It was not precise. It says, looking eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Now, see, so you think God's not a God of details? Mm -hmm. I tell you right now, the tabernacle service wouldn't go over among the people that I've been associated with. It had never been. They could never have done this. They'd have flunked the test the first time. They are, people today are arguing about whether they should do what God tells them to do. Boy, you did what God told you to do back here. Mm -hmm. It was a depiction that this is how it is when you come before God. You have a strong appeal to His mercy. And one other thing about the mercy seat, God talked to Moses from the mercy seat. Here it is in number 789. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, this God, then he heard the voice of one speaking to him from off the mercy seat. How's that? But you see how prominent the mercy seat was? <laughs> Remember, this is a depiction of God's mercy and of God's, the relevance of God's mercy. God's made known to you in His mercy. 
You've got to, if you can't see God's merciful, you, you won't be able to see anything else. You see his, see his person through his mercy, his great mercy, the scripture says. Another thing, they, his mercy is what we're appealing to. Christ Jesus appealed to God's mercy. That is, he drew this aspect out of his person. See, God has other traits. God is intolerant with sin. God can't acquit the guilty. God visits the transgression of people even under the third and fourth generation. These are some of God's traits. But in redemption, this brings out his mercy. See? Glorious mercy. And that's where atonement's made when God's mercy is satisfied. Prior to the coming of Christ, just God's justice loomed larger than his mercy. This, this is how it appeared. Mm -hmm. But once Christ's atoning blood touched God's mercy, his mercy loomed higher than justice and judgment. And we'll see this in Scripture. Now there's several principles to be seen in this rather vivid portrayal of the mercy seat. First is a marvelous depiction in the mercy seat of angelic inquiry. Here you have these cherubims looking down into the ark and everything in the ark, everything in the ark was something God did. There wasn't anything in the ark of the covenant that the Israelites did. Huh? You wouldn't have like Samson's jawbone of an ass in there. That wasn't in there. Nothing the Israelites did was in there. The law, God gave it. The rod that budded, God made it bud. Golden pot of man, that's what God gave and he had these cherubims looking down into that as though to inquire into it. Angels aren't so interested in what we're, we do, mm -hmm. although they see it. Mm -hmm. We think sometimes we're spared by intercession, by Christ's intercession. Mm -hmm. the angels aren't accustomed to letting things get by. You know? uh, the scriptures speak specifically to this <clears throat> in 1 Peter 1, 12. Here's what it says. Upon unto whom it was revealed, that's the holy prophets, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Mm -hmm. See, there it is. The perfect depiction of the mercy seat. And you don't want to stand before the Lord of glory on the day of judgment, which you will, and say the angels wanted to look into what didn't apply to them. It did apply to me, I, and I didn't look into it. You don't, you don't want to be in that condition. Look into what God has given. So there's a depiction there. There's also their wings covering the mercy seat of like of angelic protection. There's a host of innumerable angels. They're called in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, an innumerable company of angels. The book of the Revelation refers to them as thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It's just millions and millions. It's just, And the only thing we know that angels do is take care of God's people. Now they praise God, but their fundamental work is ministering to the heirs of salvation. Now the scriptures, the scriptures tell us, and when you think of the, how vast the number of them is, this is like the wings overshadowing the mercy seat. It's Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. To which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy foes, thy enemies, thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? Are they not all, all of them, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Is that not, is that not who they are? That's like the wings covering the mercy seat. When we're through, when we finish our earthly course here, and time is no more, and the heavens and the earth have passed away, and we see everything clearly. See, up beneath all of the scene, there's an unseen kingdom right now. We've already received it. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, says we have received a kingdom that can't be shaken. And part of it is an innumerable company of angels. When we, when we see the vast company of angels that hovered over us, mm -hmm. protecting us in the mercy of God, it's going to... 
it's going to be the occasion for a lot of praise, let me tell you. Now, here's another thing in the mercy seat. Mercy is higher than law, and it triumphs over judgment. Now, James actually says this in James 2.13. Remember, the law was in the Ark of the Covenant, but the mercy was on top of the law. <laughs> We'd all be damned if this wasn't so, brethren. Now, here's what it says, James 2.13. He shall have judgment against without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. The New International Version says, mercy triumphs over judgment. <laughs> the mercy seat that covered the Ark of the Covenant. As though, as though the condemnation didn't come out against the people because of God's, because of God's mercy. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And Peter said it's abundant mercy. It's abundant mercy. According to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us. It's like the gold, the pure gold. Abundant. This mercy seat. <clears throat> it's also a picture of what the scripture calls propitiation. I like that word. Some of the other versions choose not to use it. But it is a word in scripture, propitiation. It's used three times. One in Romans, the third chapter, verse 25. Whom, that's Christ, God has set forth to be a propitiation to faith in his blood. Also in 1 John, the second chapter, in verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. A propitiation is a covering, merciful covering. It's God's mercy covering our <laughs> sinful situation like God's mercy covered the law that pointed out our sinful situation. The propitiation. Now in propitiation, the appeal is to God's mercy, not to God's justice. I've done my best. I've done everything you said. That's not the appeal. The appeal is to God's mercy. Ephesians 2.4 encapsulating our great salvation says... But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love with he had loved us, See, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, that quickened us together with Christ and raised us up and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places, he says, according to his mercy. The predominant quality of God that's seen in salvation is his mercy, which is an aspect of his grace. Grace is a, is a bigger word, but mercy is a very prominent word part of grace. That is, when God saw our deplorable condition, it moved him to have mercy upon us rather than to slay us. See? God be praised. Mm -hmm. I thank God that he didn't, he didn't take me out. Mm -hmm. Amen. All of us should well thank God for that. Mm -hmm. God's mercy covered, covered the ark where the law was. Titus, the third chapter, verse 5, it it talks about this great mercy, not by works of righteousness as we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So just as uh, your salvation, when you look into it, in its finest details, you won't find a single solitary thing that you did. You, you look into your salvation, it's going to be just like when you, if you looked into the ark. You didn't see anything man did. You only saw what God did. That's all. What God did. That's what you saw. And in your salvation, you see what God has done. And our, the text I'm emphasizing here is that he did it in his mercy. His mercy did it. So no one deserved this. To God be the glory. You remember that Jesus quote said of a publican, a certain publican, <laughs> said that, Two men were praying on the corner at the same time. One was a Pharisee, and he said he prayed with himself. <laughs> that always kind of interested me. Said, he prayed with himself. And he said, that I thank thee, I'm not his other man. He cited what he did. See, when he opened up his ark, <laughs> what he did was in there. His publican, he smote his breast, and what did he appeal to? He sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, so to speak. He appealed to mercy. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He appealed to mercy, just like the mercy seat was appealed to mercy. Jesus said, he went down to his house justified. God wants to show mercy. 
Amen. So he urges us to seek it. And, of course, there's divine communication at the mercy seat. God spoke to Moses from off the mercy seat. If you really want to understand the word of God, the things of God, you, want to, you don't want the kingdom of God to be a mystery to you. You're not going to learn it from the Greek. You are not opponent to Greek. I speak a little Greek myself, but it, it's not quite what it's cracked up to be. If you really want God to talk to you, he's not going to talk to you through the clergy, or through the church, or through the various books that are offered in his name. He's going to talk to you through his mercy. Amen. Now Paul, this is something, he was an expert in divine mercy. He said, God showed me mercy as a pattern to those that should afterward receive, uh, believe. If you want God to talk to you, you've got to come to God as someone who doesn't deserve what he wants to give. You have to own up to it. I'm not worthy like Jacob of the least of the mercies you've shown to me. And when you do, it's out of his mercy he reveals himself to you. If you see God as merciful, that's not all you'll see. You'll see a lot of other things too. So he communicates to you within the context of of mercy. Now if you examine the way you've grown in Christ, see, and I've, I've seen all of you, I've seen you grow in grace and truth. You'll never know what it means to me. I have recently talked to people that have, have not seen anybody in their congregation grow. That is kind of a depressing thing to see. But if, if, you, if you examine, if you're, you're one of those growing ones, you'll find out that when you saw God as merciful and gracious, that's the point where you begin to grow. That's when things begin to open up to you, is precisely at that point. That's what the mercy seat is all about. And just as the incense covers the mercy seat, Christ's sacrifice brings out God's mercy. Oh, it covers God's mercy and brings it out. 1 Peter, the first chapter, and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as by something Jesus did, as it brought out this, this great mercy. So those are marvelous principles. There's much more than this to be seen, but... There's marvelous principles to be seen there. In the mercy seat, there's the angelic inquiry. They're looking... They want to look into what God's done. <laughs> See, tables of stone, tables of the covenant, rod that budded, golden pot of manna. That's what God's done. They're looking. They want to look into that. Now, in the gospel, the gospel is a message of what God has done. It's not a message of what you should do. It's a message of what God has done, and angels are wanting to inquire into it. And they have a glorious ministry toward the saints. We don't know all the details about it, but it'll be it'll be opened up to us mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of these days. <clears throat> you'll see that when days went well for you, there were a lot of a lot of, probably a lot of angelic activity that made things go well. You saw circumstances frustrated that looked like they were getting out of hand. They were probably instrumental in all of that. You know, the, the, the wings of the angels over the Ark of the Covenant, let's state that in another way. The angel of the Lord camps round about them that fear him to deliver them from fear of evil. See, their wings hovering over them. Now the substance, of course, in all of this is Christ. This is a depiction most precisely of Christ himself. In fact, Jesus is the mercy seat. That's what he is. He's the mercy seat. He's the means by which we have access to God. He's the means by which God speaks to us. He's the means by which God reveals himself. The scripture tells us that this Christ is so significant and the mercy of God, the grace of God is so grand that it's going to actually be expounded throughout all eternity. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be the subject of exposition. So you do want to learn to talk about grace here. Amen. Because that's all we're going to hear there. Mm -hmm. Here's what Ephesians 2.7 says. 
that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. <laughs> if that mercy seat wasn't there, God's glory wouldn't have been seen. If that mercy seat wasn't there, God wouldn't have talked. There wouldn't have been fragrance. There wouldn't have been pleasing, pleasing to God at all. But the mercy seat was there, so that brought that all that benefit to the people. Now Christ brings God's benefits to us, mm -hmm. all through Him. Hebrews one and verse, verse one and two tells us how through Christ God speaks to us through Christ. People will say often, "Well, God spoke to me and said." Well, now we don't say that that's not possible. Understand? It all is subject is subject to examination. But I can tell you, God doesn't speak to anybody unless it's through Christ. Mm -hmm. That's who he talks through. Mm -hmm. If someone in the camp of Israel said, well, we understand that God talks to Moses from over the mercy seat, I think I'll go out in the nether part of the camp out here and, and I'll ask God to talk to me. Well, he just as well go back in his tent because it isn't going to happen. God speaks to us through Christ. Now, this is said specifically. There's no ambiguity about this. Is the first two verses of Hebrews 1. It state God who at sundry times and diverse manners, that is, it wasn't consistent in all the times, just here, some, once in a while here, a little bit there, but it wasn't consistent. Diverse times and sundry places, spake in the time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these, these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Yes, that's the mercy seat from over the mercy seat. By whom, all, whom he appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world. So his son Jesus created everything and going to get everything. Mm -hmm. So does it make sense for God to speak to us through somebody else? He speaks to us through the one that made everything and is going to inherit everything. So the closer you are to Jesus, the more you learn. Mm -hmm. Further you are from Jesus, the less you learn. This is just a kind of a, a kingdom axiom, so to speak. So draw near to him. And it will, uh, if you've been around for a little while, you're probably aware that there's a, there's a phenomenal amount of religion out there that doesn't have much to say about Christ at all. But Christ, uh, God speaks where Christ is. And Christ is the one upon whom the glory of God rests. If you want to see God's glory, you've got to see Christ. Because that's where it rests, just like the glory was on the mercy seat. That's where the God's glory was over the mercy seat. That's where it was. And here's what the scripture says about it in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which accounts for our salvation. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Now the parallel there is with Moses' face. See, that's, that's the parallel. Moses, he went up to talk with God. And the glory of the Lord penetrated the skin of his face. The skin of his face glowed. He had to put a veil over it. Uh, that's in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Just previous to this, and he expounded that. Now in Christ, Christ, the full glory of God is in Christ's face, but he doesn't wear a veil. <laughs> he doesn't wear a veil. In fact, we peer into it, and that's what transforms you. That's what transforms you. When you see God's glory in the face of Christ, that's what changes you. See? Just like the glory of the, uh, that was over the mercy seat. 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says, He calls you unto the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, he doesn't say the glory of God here. He says it's the glory of Christ. It's not a competing glory. It's the glory of God that's in Christ. It's called Christ's glory because he confers it. Mm -hmm. He's the one that gives it. Mm -hmm. Do you see what, a, mm -hmm. what an exact parallel there is here in this, uh, in this mercy seat? Glory. Christ is the, is the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. And if Christ is, uh, if you're in Christ, the law can't <laughs> condemn you. It can't, right. it can't condemn you. And if you're in Christ, your rod will bud. Huh? God will show you. He'll approve of you, in other words. He'll approve of you, and you'll be able to minister to him because he approves of you. When we ask people to serve the Lord, we're not asking just to 
go out and work hard for Jesus and this sort of thing. We're asking for you to see the glory and see that God approves. You want to study or give diligence to show yourself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. A workman that does not have reason to be ashamed handling and right the word of, God, word of truth. That's this rod that budded in you. When you uh, come into Christ, you'll find supernatural nourishment ministered to you through the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. It will happen. So the law, the tables of the law, and divine approval, the rod that budded, and divine provisions like the manna, they all are covered by mercy. That's the only reason we have any of these things, brother. Amen. That's right. The mercy. And mercy is not brass. Mercy's not brass. Mm -hmm. It's not shit and wood. Mm -mm. It's gold. Yeah. It's been tried in the fire. So I bid you to the glory and the mercy seat we have now. There's a song that we have sung in the past that there's about the mercy seat. There's one common place where you all meet around the mercy seat. Now in the, in the tabernacle only one person <laughs> met there. But we all can meet 